Good morning. Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you're not new here among us, you know I wasn't here last week. So I want to take a moment and thank Pastor Rob for delivering a great message and Dustin, our media director, for taking care of the Bible study for me. And also, if you are not new here, if you've been here for a long time, you know I did not arrive here at C3 Church as a pastor. I arrived here at C3 Church as a business person. And if you've been here for a while, you know that I came into ministry through the worship because I was a musician before I was a martial arts instructor and business person. And you might know that my instrument of choice was guitar. I like to play the guitar. I did that for many years. But what you might not know, even if you know me pretty well, is that one of the instruments I played was the trumpet. So this morning, before we begin, dig into the word, I want to tell you a little bit about the trumpet. The first thing that you must know about the trumpet is that It is an absolutely disgusting instrument. That is the first thing. It has a spit valve on it. This is because, as you can imagine, when you're blowing into the trumpet, you are spitting into it. That's why I don't eat birthday cake. Anyway, you have a spit valve to release some of that spit so it doesn't all build up in there. That's really disgusting. The other thing that you might not know about the trumpet is that you're not just blowing into it. It's not like that, like one of those party blowers. Nope. It's really hard to play the trumpet because you have to press your lips very tightly and make them vibrate. I'm not going to do that and spit all over the front row. Plus, I have a microphone really close to my face. What you might not know about the trumpet is that the higher note you want to play, the tighter your lips have to go. So really good trumpet players can play really, really high. Now, I don't know why I picked the trumpet. As a kid, like you get to like third or fourth grade in New York, back in the 80s, and they make you do an instrument if you're musically inclined. And I picked the trumpet, and I was immediately sorry that I did. But here's the thing. My parents were disciplinarians. They were really big on commitment. Plus, they paid the instrument rental for the year. So I had to stick with it, and my parents were musicians. I come from a family of musicians, and they're all better than me, which was really bad. But they made me practice. They said, you will get better if you practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Or just drive to New York City. Anyway, (laughs) I had to practice a lot, and it was terrible. I did not like it. I had to practice for like a minimum of an hour a day. That's a lot of lip stuff. It was pretty annoying. This was all in the 80s. Well, if you grew up in the 80s like me, you know what a boombox is. And I'll tell you what went through your mind. This, 
right? Because that's what you did if you were really cool and you wanted to go deaf. The boom, <laughs> the boom box was big. It had these big speakers on it, and it was really loud. And what was cool about the boom box was that it had a cassette tape on it. Now, that doesn't sound exciting to the kids with the smartphones, because you can get like great quality, even video on your phone. But this was really cool. If you were a kid, you could put tape over the tape and then tape over the tape. And so you can record things. And if you didn't have a lot of money, you could play the radio on the boom box and record what was on the radio and rob the record stores. So it was just a wonderful thing. Well, one day, little Gene put two and two together and discovered that you could also record things like a trumpet. And so I practiced my trumpet one day and recorded it. Then the next day, I simply pressed play. And the boom box was as loud as the trumpet, so I went and I played Atari instead. You know what an Atari is? Ooh, it was fun. And so I would get done practicing, I'd go downstairs, and my mom would be like, oh, I heard you're practicing, good job. And I was like, yeah, mom, my lips are really sore. Well, I got away with this for a while, until the concert came, about fifth grade. Apparently, I was good enough to do a solo. I don't know how that happened. The song was Danny Boy, an old like kind of Irish folk song. I don't know the history about it, but I do know this. It has a really high note in it. Yeah, so I was confident, I don't know why. I got up there and played, and everything's going great until the high note. Bah, bah, bah. Oh, epic failure. Very, very embarrassing. So while it seemed like I was sacrificing a lot of time and practicing, in reality, I was being disobedient. And I paid the price for my Lip service. Oh. Okay, today we find ourselves, you'll see where I'm going with that later, in the rest of the story where we're looking at 1 Samuel. We looked at chapters 1 through 7 two weeks ago, so I'll refresh your memory. It was the early life of Samuel, and he was like that threefold leadership type in the Bible. First, you have the prophets. Even Abraham is called a prophet. Then you have a priest, right? There are priests. Then there are judges, the book of Judges. Samuel is all three wrapped up into one. And we saw that Samuel was faithful with the little things. Today we're gonna see that he's all grown up. So we're gonna start 1 Samuel chapter eight, starting at verse one. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba, well of the oath. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So if you've been paying attention to the story, you know the word well, this should remind you of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Now, Samuel is experiencing the same thing. And at first glance, it seems like that's the reason they're asking for a king. They're putting it on Samuel. But the Lord corrects that. They've been rejecting me ever since I rescued them out of Egypt. Not your fault. They're rejecting me. Horrible thing. They're rejecting God, they want a king, so Samuel warns them, I'll just kind of make this short for you. He warns them that a king, he's gonna draft your people into the army. He's basically gonna make slaves out of you guys, he's gonna take away your daughters, he's gonna take away the best of your crops, and he's gonna impose taxes on you, he's gonna take a tithe. But 
1 Samuel 8, 19, the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king. They said, we want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people said, and the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. Samuel agreed and sent the people home. And so, 1 Samuel 9, 1, turn the page, there was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bikarath, son of Aphiah of the tribe of Benjamin. If you're wondering, I was worried about that this morning. I got through it. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. So one day, Kish loses some donkeys. And so he sends Samuel and a servant out to find them. Maybe it's because he was really tall and he could see over everything and find them. I don't know. They go through a few towns and now Saul wants to give up. If I said Samuel, I meant Saul. <clears throat> Saul wants to give up, he's done. But his servant says, hold on a second. I remembered something. There's a man of God who can help us. They're in a land called Zuff. That's the area they're in, in case you were wondering. Where are they? He's in this town, says he's a seer. In those days, they called prophets seers. Okay, let's find him. And now we get a scene where there are girls coming out of this town to get water. That happens a lot in the Old Testament. The girls affirm, yes, he's there. He's getting ready to make the sacrifices. Everybody's gonna wait for him before we eat. Remember that, some people are actually waiting for him. So this is where Samuel will come in. They approach the town, and here's what happens. Now, in the meantime, the Lord has told Samuel that Saul's coming. Also, the servant's pretty cool. He has a small silver piece, so they're worried. The first objection that Saul has is, well, we don't have any money. We don't have anything to give him. I guess they were paying those people back then. So the servant supplies the money. So finally, 1 Samuel 9, 18, just then Saul approached Samuel at the gateway and asked, can you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up to the place of worship ahead of me. We will eat there together, and in the morning I will tell you what you want to know and send you on your way. And don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago, for they have been found. And I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. Saul replied, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking to me like this? Sound familiar? Now, if you've been paying attention, you know why the tribe of Benjamin is small. I'll get to that a little later. Here's something I want to point out to you, though. Pay attention to what Samuel does as a real prophet. He proves it. Hear this. A prophet will prove it. We talked about this a little bit at Bible study, about authority attaches to Pastor Rob's message, where that comes from, from God. But prophets prove it. In my time in ministry, I've had a lot of people come into the church, and they say, this is what God told me to tell you. Nine times out of ten, it has that person's agenda behind it. I really don't think that God told them that. And they don't prove it. I've also been told I have something from God. And when it really is, they blow my mind. I want to wear a tinfoil hat around them. <laughs> I didn't talk to one lady for two months one time. She was in the church. I wouldn't speak to her because she blew my mind. She told me things that only I could know and my mom it was crazy. That's what prophets do, and that's what he's doing with the donkeys here. He's telling Saul something that probably nobody else could know, but he'll double down on this. So if you're saying that you're a prophet and you've got a word from the Lord, don't tell me something like, it's going to rain at 3 p.m. today, because we're in southwest Florida. <laughs> that's not a big deal. So anyway, 
And he brings them in and they have this meal. And he's already propping Saul up. This is Samuel propping Saul up. He gives him the, the best place at the table above the 30 other honored guests. He gives him the choice food that is reserved for the guest of honor. He's treating him absolutely wonderfully. When they're done, he takes him up to a rooftop, prepares a bed for him. That's weird. Well, no AC back then. So in the evenings, it's got to be cool and breezy up there. So they're going to sleep on the roof. That's very, very common back then. Well, in the morning, it says this happens. 1 Samuel 9, 26. At daybreak the next morning, Samuel called Saul. Get up. It's time you were on your way. So Saul got ready, and he and Samuel left the house together. When they reached the edge of town, Samuel told Saul to send his servant on ahead. After the servant was gone, Samuel said, stay here, for I have received a spe special message for you from God. Really cool in the Greek. I want you to hear the word of God. So turn the page, Lonnie. For Samuel 10.1, then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. Now he anoints him. We've talked about that in this series. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. And here he does what I'm talking about. He gives a series of predictions to prove it. You are going to see two men at Rachel's tomb on your way back. They're going to let you know the donkeys have been found. But your dad's now worried about you. Oak of Tabor, three men. One's going to have three goats. One's going to have three loaves. They're going to offer you two of the loaves. They're also going to have a wineskin full of wine. You accept the two loaves. He keeps going as if that wasn't enough. At Gibeah of God, there's going to be prophets coming out. They're going to be playing instruments, not a trumpet, but a harp, tambourine, a flute, a lyre, and the Spirit of God, not like a lying lyre, but like a guitar. Imagine that. The Spirit of God is going to come upon you, and you'll be changed greatly, and you too will prophesy. Well, sure enough, because Samuel is legit, it all happens just that way. He also says something I want you to remember. He says, when you get to Gilgal, where you're going, wait seven days for me. Wait. That's important. So the signs are fulfilled. You'll see that Saul has some detractors. This will happen to him. So they're saying things like, can even Saul be a prophet? Why is he a prophet? Well, anyone can be a prophet because God just uses you. Use the donkey, right? but they're making fun of him. So he gets back to town. His uncle asks him what's up. He tells him about the seer that he saw. <laughs> what did he tell you? Well, that the donkeys are back and leaves everything else out. He doesn't talk about being anointed king at all. But Samuel, he gathers everybody up at Mizpah. If this sounds familiar to you, it's because it was where the Levite went. Remember the Levite and the concubine? And he gathered everybody up against the tribe of Benjamin, 400,000 men. So that's where this happened. Gathering at the same place. I'm going to connect a lot of dots for you today. This makes the word of God smaller and easy to remember. And he gives a speech. And he's constantly reminding them, you've rejected God. I'm like, that's the point. So fine. This is a concession for you guys. So he does a process of selection. We'll see this. Sometimes they cast lots, but he goes down and he reaches the tribe of Benjamin. This is where your king is going to come from. And then process of deduction down to Saul. Now here's where it's kind of comical, I think, if you're reading it. There's a little comedy here in God's word. How tall is Saul? He's a head taller than everyone. And depending on the translation you're reading, it says he's hiding but he's hiding amongst the baggage <laughs> or the luggage. And so I get a scene in my mind, you know those rolly carts that the, the bellmen use? I don't know what you're supposed to call them anymore. Like, I, apparently I was told this week that people aren't called waiters or waitresses anymore. You have to, I can't remember what, servers? They're called servers. So anyway, I'm from the 80s, so we use old language. But anyway, probably offended anyone who's like was a bellhop, I don't know, luggage carrier. But I picture like Saul trying to hide behind one of these things, like, you know, as it moves along, but he can't because his head is like sticking up over it. So it's comical. Like Saul's trying to hide among the baggage, but he can't. Yeah, because you just told us he's like too tall for hiding. 
Not good at hide and seek. Anyway, <laughs> he's accepted as king for the most part, except for some people from his own hometown. Remember that. Nonetheless, he is made king. And what's interesting is he's rejected. His hometown is Gibeah. This is where the story of the Levite and the concubine took place, a Benjamite town, all coming full circle. Now, there's a guy named Nahash. Nahash has a nasty habit of gouging people's eyes out. That's what he likes to do. He's a king. <laughs> so he's an Ammonite king. He's oppressing Gad and Reuben. It's kind of complicated, but if you know the word well, you'll nod at this point. They're the tribes that didn't want to settle down on the other side of the Jordan River. They wanted to stay where they were. There was an issue. They made an altar there. Phineas has to get involved. So they're the tribes that are getting oppressed right, by this Ammonite king, Nahash, and they're gouging people's eyes out. But 7,000 of them escape. Now, to Jabesh Gilead, and this all get kind of interesting if you know the word. You may be reading along and saying, where did you get 7,000 from? We'll talk about it at Bible study. It's one of the things that has been redacted from a lot of Bibles, but it is in the older versions. So Jabesh Gilead, again, full circle, is where the wives from the tribe of Benjamin were first taken from, the first 400. There were 600 men left when they had this war, and they found 400. But now this town, Jabesh Gilead, is kind of like getting repopulated because of this persecution. There's 7,000 people there. Gets more interesting. There's a lot of depth here if you know the word. Nahash, I said it, is an Ammonite king. And this goes all the way back to Lot. Remember what happened. Sodom and Gomorrah, even if you haven't read the Bible a whole lot, you probably know this story. Right? It's destroyed. Lot and his daughters escape. The wife does what? Pillar of salt, looks back. They go to Zoar, a little place. He doesn't like the people there, so they go to a cave. And his daughters decide they're going to carry on the father's line through them. A disgusting thing. They have incestuous relations. They get him drunk. First one, son is Moab. Remember, Ruth was a Moabite, an undesirable person. And my point there was that she was redeemed anyway, makes it into Jesus' genealogy. No matter where you've come from, you're welcome in this family. She was redeemed. Well, the other one becomes the father, the younger daughter, there's two kids, becomes the father of the Ammonites. So if you know the word well, you're thinking Nahash, but he already has like kind of a bad history. He comes from a people that are from a bad line. So nasty guy. So the people there, they try to make a treaty. They say, give us seven days. We want to send messengers out, and then we'll decide whether we're going to let you gouge our eyes out or not. <laughs> Sounds kind of crazy. Well, one of the messengers reaches a place where Saul is. He's plowing in a field. He's working in a field. He hears them crying. They're all upset, and he gets real mad about it. Okay. So what he does is he cuts up a couple of his oxen, and he sends them out to all Israel. And you may be thinking, why is he doing that? Well, remember the Levite and the concubine? What did the Levite do to send a message? He cut up the concubine and send it out to rile everybody up and get 400,000 men to go against the tribe of Benjamin who were responsible for this. So it's similar. And that would be in their minds. They'd be thinking, ooh, that's in their memory. And it kind of works. He sends a message this is what will happen to the oxen of anyone who refuses to follow Saul and Samuel. He gets not quite 400,000 men. He gets 330,000 men. He defeats the Ammonites using some strategy, gets together three detachments, and he's reconfirmed king at Gilgal. Going to skip ahead, but I don't want to leave anything out. Chapter 12 can be very confusing because it seems like Saul's or Samuel's ministry is over. I'm going to get dyslexic today, so bear with me. So it's basically his farewell speech. So view it like a movie. Sometimes you have cut scenes where it cuts in and out. It may not be chronological. We are not done with Samuel yet. But he gives a speech. He reminds them of what they've done wrong. 
but I've given you a king. I haven't cheated anybody. I've been straight with you guys. He gives a summary. God's done so much for you. He starts with Egypt. He rescued you from Egypt. He jumps right over to the judges and just gives them some examples about how God is always rescuing you, but you want a king. Great. So now it's on you. He gives some signs. He makes it rain and thunder. And it works because they're not in Southwest Florida. <laughs> he proves it. He brings a sign, and now they're in terror. The conclusion of the speech is, if you continue to do what is evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Now we get to chapter 13, and it's the Philistines again. They have a history, if you remember, with the Philistines. Remember Samson and the Philistines? So there's continued war with them. And what Saul does is something interesting. He narrows down the military to 3,000 troops, 2,000 that he leads, 1,000 that his son, Jonathan, leads. We'll be talking about him the next couple of weeks. Now, Jonathan has an early victory, and it gets them all excited. And Saul calls to people with a trumpet or a horn. I don't know. I don't know how high the note was, but... He rallies everybody up, but like the ark, remember when they got the ark stolen from them? When they bring it out, it has the opposite than the desired effect. The Philistines get riled up too. Now it says the army's so huge, it's like sand on the seashore. And they're in a bad spot. They're totally outnumbered. They're in a tight spot. Men are deserting. They begin escaping and hiding. And it says this, 1 Samuel 13. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away, so he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him, but Samuel said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So remember, he was supposed to wait. He's disobedient. Samuel responds, 1 Samuel 13, 13. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed, you have not kept the command of the Lord your God that he gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. We'll get to David later. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So this is the first stage of Saul's rejection as king. Interesting points. They're whittled down to 600 men. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. How many Benjamites were there in the Levite and concubine? 600 men. So we see foreshadowing here. A terrible situation. To make things worse, they're a ragtag bunch. They all have these like farm tools. That's what they're fighting with. They're not in proper battle armor with proper weapons. Only Saul and Jonathan have the weapons. And so it's kind of funny. You get to an interesting part where it gives like a price sheet. <laughs> it's like a menu of everything the Philistines were charging to sharpen all the farm tools for them. They didn't want them to have any weapons. So if you're confused and reading along, that's what that is and why that is. So this is a desperate situation. You have 598 men there with farm tools against a professional, well-organized Philistine army. So many men, it's like the sand on the seashore. So get this in your mind. They're in bad shape. But Jonathan, he's a pretty brave kid. He and his armor bearer go and they climb up to this place where the Philistines are. He says, you know what? We're going to get a sign from God. We're going to see if we should keep fighting them, even in this desperate situation. So if they call us out and say, come fight, that's a sign. We're going to fight. If they say, get out of here, well, we're not going to fight. Sure enough, they call him out. And Jonathan and his armor bearer kill 20 men. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's about like a half acre parcel of land. So think about a medium sized yard and 20 dead bodies in your yard. So it's a sight. 
What happens is the Lord, again, begins fighting for them. There's an earthquake. It says the earth is trembling. And the Philistines get thrown into a panic. Now Saul hears it. And his reaction is, do a roll call. That sounds weird. He takes attendance. Why would you do that? Well, he's got to be thinking, who's doing this? What's going on? And they find out that Jonathan, his son, and the armor bearer aren't with them. Well, you know what? Let's consult with the Lord and see if we should go get them. So first he starts doing the right thing, but then he says, no, forget it. We don't have time for that. And he goes after them. He begins hunting them down and pursuing them. So they get tired. So they're in pursuit and the men are getting tired. They're gonna do this like all day into the evening. But Saul doesn't wanna stop. And so here's what he says, 1 Samuel 14, 24. Now the men of Israel were pressed to exhaustion that day because Saul had placed them under an oath saying, let a curse fall on anyone who eats before evening, before I have full revenge on my enemies. So no one ate anything all day, even though they had all found honeycomb on the ground in the forest. They didn't dare touch the honey because they all feared the oath they had taken. But in the meantime, Jonathan didn't take the oath. He wasn't around. So he's walking along and he sees some honeycomb. That looks delicious. So he grabs a stick. That's how you eat honeycomb. And he has a taste of the honeycomb. Someone who knows about the oath was there and he said, ah, you can't do that. Told him what his dad did and he said, that's so foolish. Look how refreshed I am. If he did let them take the honey, think about how many more Philistines we could have killed. Well, meanwhile, Saul is continuing to pursue the Philistines. And it's interesting, there's a little section in there where they're taking a lot of plunder and they sacrifice it kind of the wrong way. They eat the blood. We can talk about that at Bible study. That's a big no-no all the way back from the covenant with Noah. Saul fixes it. He builds an altar to make a longer story short. He's still pursuing them. But now the priest is like, hey, Saul, maybe we should check with God on this one. So back then they would cast lots or the priest would have an ephod and that's how they'd make decisions through the priest. He says, okay, but something strange happens. God's silent. They don't hear anything. Saul's thinking, why? What's going on here? Not because I've done anything wrong. So they go through the process of deduction again. Whose sin is this? Even if it's my own son, I'm going to kill him. (laughs) So it comes down to Saul and Jonathan. What's going on? Finally, Jonathan confesses to his father, I ate the honey. And Saul wants to kill his own son. But it's the people who intervene. They remind him, Jonathan got us a lot of victories. And so Jonathan is spared. Saul continues to have a lot of victories. Talk about this at Bible study a little bit. A lot of connections. These different tribes that they're fighting go way back, way, 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 way back, even to the story about Noah, the Canaanites, Hamsung, Canaan. It's where the Philistines come from as well. Also, the Ammonites have a history and the Amalekites. So here's what it says. One day, Samuel said to Saul, it was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people, Israel. Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation, men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Now that sounds strange. But if you know the word well, you know why this is happening. Even if you've never read the Bible, you probably know the story of Moses. God parts the Red Sea, they cross over, it crashes down on the Egyptians. Well, shortly thereafter, it's the Amalekites that decide to attack them. So to make this kind of short, you might remember the story where Joshua is fighting them and Moses is sitting there on the rock with his hands raised. Every time they lower, the Israelites lose. Every time they get raised, they win. So Aaron and her are helping them hold the hands up. That's the background here. They're also descendants of Esau. If you remember Jacob and Esau, a rivalry there. So now this whole thing is going to get fulfilled and they will be punished. Exodus 17, 14 says this, after the victory, so they win, 
There, the Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it aloud to Joshua. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar there, named it Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. He said, they have raised their fist against the Lord's throne, so now the Lord will be at war with Amalek generation after generation. So Lonnie's going to have to remind me about the Kenites. I'm going to run out of time, and I won't be able to get to that today. It's kind of cool. If you remember the story about jail and the tent peg, they warned these people called the Kenites to get out of there, and it probably goes back to that Bible study stuff. Anyway, here's the thing. He's supposed to completely wipe them out, but he doesn't. He spares the king, Agag, and they keep all the choice plunder for themselves. So now you get kind of a comical scene, but first, 1 Samuel 15, 10, then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me, and he has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. So he wakes up the next morning, he's searching for him, he runs into someone who says, oh, I know where Saul is, he's building a monument to himself at Carmel. And then he went back to Gilgal. And you get this exchange. It's almost comical because Saul denies it. Samuel approaches him. He's like, why didn't you do what the Lord said? He anointed you as king. You had this responsibility. You may think little of yourself, but God made you king, and now you've disobeyed him. And Saul denies it. (laughs) And Samuel points to the blatantly obvious. He's like, well, what's all the bleeding, like the noise from all these animals that I'm hearing? So another kind of comical scene. You have Saul standing there like, no, 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 I destroyed everything. I'm like, bah! And it's like goat walking behind him. He's like, get out of the way. It's obvious he's done wrong. And he keeps denying it. But I did destroy everything. Uh, no. So Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Obedience is better than sacrifice today, worship, busy things that we do while we're not really being obedient, an outward appearance. Saul finally relents. He admits it, but it's too little, too late. You get a very symbolic thing that happens. Samuel's going to leave him. He goes to grab on to his cloak. It tears, and it symbolizes the kingdom being torn from him. This is foreshadowing of what will happen to David. If you know the word well, you know what I'm talking about. And he says, the Lord has torn the kingdom away from you. Samuel kills King Agag, fulfilling the Lord's command. And it says this, 1 Samuel 15, 34. Then Samuel went back home to Ramah and Saul returned to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. And the Lord was sorry he ever made Saul king. We've learned in this series that God uses the seemingly weak things to shame the wise. That's what it says in his word. But Saul, he's represented as the ideal according to the world standards, right? He's a handsome guy, head taller than everybody else. But here, the seemingly strong things, again, like Samson, cause shame. God uses these people to show us that when we look for what the world sees as strong, we'll often be very disappointed. When we reject God's provision, which may seem foolish or weak to us, and go after what looks good by the world's standards, we will be led astray. They were warned by Samuel not to do that, but they did anyway. Have we too rejected God is our king. Did you know that, like Saul, 
Jesus was rejected in his own hometown, Nazareth. A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, Mark 6. But here's the thing. Have we too rejected Jesus? In what ways might we have done that? Now, you may be quick to say, no, no, no. there's no way I would ever reject Jesus. He's my king. But Jesus says there's a way in which we might have. Luke 6, 46. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? You see, God hasn't changed. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13. And he still requires obedience. People don't like it. It's kind of a bad word. And we can tell if we've accepted Jesus as king, if we do what he says. His words, not mine. It's about obedience. Are we obedient or are we just giving Jesus lip service? Have we gone after what looks attractive according to the world? Have we been baited into setting our minds on worldly things instead of thinking, Colossians 3, about heavenly things, focusing on Jesus? You see, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Faith is in what we cannot see. Like Saul, appearances deceiving. Saul looked like the perfect king. Again, a head taller than everyone else. Impressive, but looks can be deceiving. And there's no deceiving God. This is how it is when we put on a show. But we aren't really being obedient. We're just giving God lip service. You see, God desires more than the outward appearances. He wants an inward change of heart. He wants us to be totally and completely transformed, Romans 12, renewed in our minds, not thinking the way the world does. Now, I get it. It's hard. I told you. I gave my parents lip service. I wasn't being completely obedient. And through my life, it's been difficult. In my Christian walk, it's been difficult. Sometimes it's a daily battle because there's so many things in the world that are baiting us constantly, all the time the Facebook, but Jesus is asking us the question, are you loving your enemies? How are you doing that? How did that post share love with your enemies? If I had to meet someone I disagreed with politically, I think the Holy Spirit would say, D -d 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 -d. before you get to the political issues and the mistakes they might have made in their job, maybe you should get them to Jesus. You think? Or does Jesus say, well, you can love your enemies except if they have different political opinions? I don't think that's in there. And I read it a lot. It says no matter what, there's no excuse. There's no out. He doesn't want us baited by the world. It's all garbage. He wants us focused on the new heaven, the new earth. Read Colossians 3 if you don't believe me. It's God's word, not mine. So that's my prayer for us this morning. In our lives, our coaches, our teachers, the people that care about us and love us require obedience for a reason. If I had been obedient instead of giving my parents lip service, they could have saved me from a pretty embarrassing situation. And that's a small thing. But you ever get baited by being disobedient and put yourself in a bad situation? You should all be doing that. Yeah, let's not be baited into that, into disobedience. Let's focus on Jesus. Focus on what it says in his word. Because like our parents, God requires obedience because he wants what's good for us. 
Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, for everyone's willingness to come here this morning, be in the unity of your Holy Spirit, hear your word in full, listen to the scriptures, your godly wisdom, and my prayers for all of us as we go out into the world this week that we are not baited into it, that we stay focused on your word focused on the gospel message. Please, Lord, let that be what we want to share most with everyone this week. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.